welcome back to the live stream. This week we've got Dirk Entz in the house and we're going to cover monetary policy in the ECB. It should be a whole lot of fun so you better stay tuned, be kind, stay safe, and enjoy the show. Thirty-three live viewers. I'm gonna give you almost in a, a Tourette-like response. I'm gonna give you updates with numbers throughout the show, and this is the numbers of people that are watching this live show. I, I mean, you know, from when we started the show, uh, you know, we couldn't be happier. It's it, the the graphics, the the production quality, uh, the the quality of the viewers. Thank you guys very much. Is stellar. So this is great. This is all we can imagine for Stephen Friends. And today's guest, we've got Dirk Entz. And he's actually going to be talking about modern monetary theory. This is going to be a really interesting topic because the book that he's written actually goes into, I would say, kind of like, um, not so much a guide, but a resource for policymakers. Okay? Policymakers. So these would be people in government that can actually read Dirk's work, and apply this in, in real policy in governments, hopefully all around the world. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to stagger the guests, or actually, I'm going to bring Mike in first, not yet, but I'm going to bring Mike in first, and we're going to talk a little bit about Eclipse. He's got a, an anecdotal story about um, uh, a project that's coming up. I'd love to hear him tell about that because he's got to leave the show a little early. That's why he gets to come in a little bit first. Then we got Steve who's going to come into the show. And I say, I'm going to warn everybody, he's a little grumpy. Why is Steve grumpy? Well, we'll let Steve tell you that. But I'm going to give him advance warning right now that Steve, if blood sugar has anything to do with it, go up and go to the fridge and get something, some food. I mean, heck, I don't care. Go and get a glass of wine. You know, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's turn on the, the Steve Keen charm. Now, my anecdotal story about eclipses goes something like this. I want you to imagine a few years ago an eclipse happens. Now they say it's a, a an eclipse where the moon goes in front of the, the sun, okay? So the, the full luminance is still, um, there's, there's very little loss of luminance, okay? So the sun is still coming back and you actually get the feeling of the warmth of the sun on your body. Okay, so this is a really interesting feeling that most, well, I'd say almost every human understands, understands that when they're, when they're standing in front of the sun, there's this feeling of warmth. You can feel the sun's radiance actually um, on your skin. I want you to imagine eclipse now. Now eclipse goes, the moon goes in front, the luminance probably degrades with some sort of, we could measure the luminance intensity, you could see that it probably would decrease. However, in my experience, I was in front of the feeling the warmth of the sun, the moon goes over in this odd feeling of coolness, without a loss of luminance, at least how I could perceive it. So it was a really weird feeling. I, I, I described it as out of this world. <laughs> it really was an out of this world feeling. And I think that's what Mike's project is a little bit, a little bit outside of this world. I want to bring Mike into the studio. Mike, come on in and let's hear about your yeah, uh, hi Dan plans and how they can eclipse mine. <laughs> uh, right, clever. <laughs> hi everybody. Uh, yeah, well today uh, um, I'm taking my granddaughter and helping to uh, herd the Girl Scouts over to an organization called New England SciTech. They're a K through 12 family STEM organization center here in Massachusetts, and they are helping Harvard University's, um, I guess, astrophysics department. And, and Harvard has a project 
for the upcoming April 8th solar eclipse to help the visually impaired experience the eclipse. They obviously have trouble seeing. So uh, the uh, and I, I'm outside of I'm an economist, not a physicist. So I'm now talking outside of my sandbox. But somehow the visuals from the eclipse, the light waves, I guess, are going to be translated into sound for the visually impaired. And so they've designed some simple kits to make this happen, but they have to be assembled, including soldered together. So they've appealed um, Harvard to New England SciTech and then to WPI to, to um, uh, help with the soldering and assembly of these kits. So we're gonna be doing that this afternoon with the Girl Scouts. Nice, nice, nice. I've heard you talk about today's topic quite often about modern mm -hmm. monetary policy and <clears throat> I feel that you, you're starting on kind of first principles. Like it's not really a theory and there's some standard types of things that you kind of get into. My frustration, and I'm hoping you can help me with my frustration, because if, if I'm frustrated, I'm imagining there's people out there that are also frustrated. I'd like to know how to get people to um, spearhead this project outside of a bar by, bipartisan political divide, right? So, you know, completely rhetorical. We don't need to answer it right now, but that's where I'm going. And you, you, you want to see this grab some legs, so to speak. And, and maybe it is grabbing legs. The work of, of, of Stephanie Kelton, we're going to be talking about her work. We're going to be talking about, yep. um, uh, you know, uh, Steve's work. There's actually a collaboration coming up that maybe Steve will, will feel free to, to elaborate on a little bit more. Um, and on that note, actually, let's just bring Steve onto the show. Come on, Steve. Let's, let's, let's hear all about it. Let's hear about what you're working on. And Hi there, guys. Yep. Hey, Steve. Gals. Hi, hi, Matt. How are you? Oh, just that um, there's a conference on modern monetary theory coming up in Leeds. I think it's Leeds. I've got a better check before I give myself the wrong <laughs> UK town. Um, but I'm going to be doing a joint paper with Stephanie Kelton on uh, modern monetary theory and basically showing how you can prove the basic tenets of modern, modern monetary theory just by laying out the accounts in my my Minsky software's godly tables and show that uh, yeah. you know the, 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 the incessant stupid and I'm using that work of somebody called me that earlier on Twitter stupid uh, m misunderstanding of money uh, with some people not understanding that government doesn't borrow it creates and other people not understanding that private banks don't borrow they also <laughs> create. Uh, and we get this crazy um, failing to understand the monetary system. And frankly, I think it's, it's, it's going to outlive us. Uh, these, mm. these crazy inabilities to understand the basic accounting of money have characterized the debate over money for 250 years. And it's going to keep on going after we pop off the mortal coil. So that's why I'm a grumpy old man. Today. So, so <clears throat> Steve, if I could just hop in real quickly. So um, some years ago, really 20 years ago, maybe um, <clears throat> I took a paper by uh, Stephanie and Randy Ray where they uh, imagined uh, the New York subway system as the economy and subway tokens as mm. the, the currency. And they use that to try and explain modern monetary theory. So I built a system dynamics model of their paper and I called it token land. And I presented it out at, at UMKC. And I don't know, yeah. I've met Stephanie <clears throat> several times, but I don't think she remembers exactly who I am. But I read one of her posts once. She said, who is that guy that made the hydraulic model of our stuff? I, that was probably me. <laughs> so say hello to her for me and say I'm the token we'll do, guy. Will do, will do. Will do, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Mm. I think let's um, let's bring let's bring uh, Dirk onto the show. Um, Dirk, come on. Let's uh, let's 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 meet the man himself who wrote the book. Who's who's wrote the book on monetary? Yeah. 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 Hey, Dirk. Oh. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be on the show again. Good to see you all. Yeah, yeah. What if yeah. we can? Uh, you know, I'm going to prompt the you know the production team. Let's get a, uh, an image of his book up and let's just jump right into it. So, yeah, sure. As as that digs around, you know, we can. There we go. There we go. Professional practice in governance and public organization. A book by by Dirk Entz, 
modern monetary theory a simple guide to the monetary system. I put an emphasis on sim simple there. Uh, Dirk, how simple is it? And, and how, how is the book structured? Can you give us an overview of the structure on, the, on, on this, this title? Yeah, so what I try to do here is I try to, to talk about money come starting obviously with the government and um, not showing balance sheets, but using more or less logic and little stories and bringing out certain narratives and making sure that, that I also get, uh, get uh, the things that he said about money creation. Um, I think it was actually one of his um, um, Democrat, fellow Democrats, um, I think the representative um, from Kentucky in the um, in the House, who is the the, um, the budget committee's uh, head, I think. Um, so he said a couple of things where he says that the government, the federal government, controls the amount of money in circulation, and that they can always spend more. So he even recommended uh, Stephanie Kelton's great book, The Deficit Myth. Um, so I'm I'm trying to convince people using a, a mix of logic, um, and also um, I have Alan Greenspan there. So quotes from famous economists, famous central bankers who every once in a while said things that were correct. So, so Steve Keen is right. I mean, if you go back the, the, the last 250 years, you will always find people who don't understand money. Um, but for a couple of decades, every once in a while, um, a lot of people do understand and did understand money. Um, so for example, uh, I saw Josef Schumpeter uh, appearing on the screen in the intro of this show. So he understood definitely endogenous money creation, so bank money creation. And I think he also understood that the state can create its own money, um, but he was very, uh, very much against it. So um, when, when uh, Georg Friedrich Knapp was die, uh, died um, in the 1920s, he wrote the, the state theory of money, which is uh, a book that created chartalism. And chartalism is the idea that money only has a value, a price, a positive price, because you can, you can use it to pay taxes, which is the, the monetary ch charter. That's the source of value, if you want. Um, so back back in the days, I stood this kind of stuff, and I'm trying to help why money is created, how money is created, um, and this is for for people who are working in governance and also working in the public sector, and if they want to understand how money really works and what you can do it, with it and what kind of problems it creates. So how do we get full employment? How do we get price stability? And also how do we how do we get a sustainable economy? Um, then that's hopefully a book that can help them to, to find uh, answers to these kind of questions and also references to, to continue reading about these kind of topics. Okay, great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into something really specific. I want, I want you to give us an example as if you were a public policymaker in the United States, and let's talk about um, uh, defense funding, for example. Okay, so... I'm just arbitrarily coming in, in, you know, something is coming to mind with that. Why not something like um, Ukraine, supporting Ukraine? Okay, so, so Dirk, explain yeah. what sort of nuance you're a pub, uh, uh, somebody in public office would actually be able to take the framing and the mental model that they would um, put in place in context with, with what your work is providing them. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question, Dan. Uh, that's exactly what the book is about. So normally we would talk about the money and everybody would say, well, but that's very costly, like, I don't know, 50 billion US dollars, and we could spend that money on something else, and so on and so on. Um, but it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit off. Um, so it's about resources. So if you if you create, or if you if you build arms that you send to, to Ukraine, then of course, there will be people in the private sector working on these, these arm, uh, arms production. And there will be machines which will be used for that and energy and raw materials. And that's really the cost of it. Okay, so it's not about the money. It's about the, can you afford to use those resources? What would you do with those resources if you weren't sending arms to the to Ukraine? Maybe if, if then you wouldn't produce anything at all, then there would be lots of unemployment and there would be an oversupply of energy, let's say, which pushes energy prices down. So, of course, it's, it's very complex. Um, but I mean, we are living in the 21st century. So if you want to break it down, if you want to have a look at what kind of resources are used, what kind of energy, what kind of labor, uh, what's really needed to do this. And then you can you can think about opportunity costs. So I can put all these people working into the Ukraine arms sector or I can 
move them out of that sector and put them into, I don't know, sustainable energy generation. Okay, so and then, of course, as a politician, I have to choose. It's my choice. What do we do with those resources? I'm democratically elected, for example. Um, so I can I can decide or I can be part of the decision making team casting my vote. But I need to understand what's going on and what's going on is it's not about the money. Um, it's about the resources. And I think the book mm. is kind of helping people understand what is possible in this economy and why money creation does not automatically end with hyperinflation and uh, Venezuela or, or whatever. That's very interesting. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually thinking that um, if, if, if you look at, I don't know, like a credit rated system between, um, between countries around the world, be probably really interesting to examine the, the, the relative resource supply nations one nation has versus another uh you know that would that would be very interesting because canada is a very resource rich country um so if that's a, a effectively our um our capital then it's kind of the, the sovereign capital of the of the country and then what is our international obligations to be able to at least from our own interest maintain global stability or play our, our part in in global emissions and all that kind of stuff that's very very fascinating um, Mike, um, now is that time, and and I'm thinking I'm going to try and pry it out of you, Mike. What what time do you think it is? Um, if you were a chatter and and you were one of the top chatters, what what time do you think it is right now for for Mike to to step up to the stage? What what would you suggest? So, uh, who are you asking? Mike, so funny. I was trying to come out and name. To say it's time for Mike to read their top chatters the list. Yeah, okay, it. yeah. <laughs> I was trying to diagnose what was being asked there. So okay, <clears throat> okay. Here we go. Top chatters and commenters: Santi, Brad Atherton, Joe Polito, Harry Heyman, Philadelphia, Algorithm, Felipe Burns, Rick O'Brien, Demand a Better World, Ghost on a Half Shell, Alpinism, Utilitar. Circulari, Economici, Bob Liori, She Watches, TR, Downtown, Xmas Tree, Wayne McMillan, Economics in One Lesson. I got to take that course. Uh, the Django Geek, Jens Runberg, Man, Manoharan, Larry Summers is with us again. <laughs> Jean Noel Av Avila, William Hepworth, Thomas Darling, Johnny, er Ernesto Eduardo Dobarganis, Political Economy 101, Tomas Serde. Velkansky Bick, Stavros, Kara Georges, Dave Collins, Big Hammer, love it, JBay088, <laughs> Jim Roberts, Rob Pierce, Sunroad, Marty Summers, and Bill Goggin. Yeah! Welcome. <laughs> right. Okay. That was great. I, I have to say, we're all getting better at it because we're getting used to some of the the names, right? So they come a, a little yeah. bit easier. Dirk, a little forewarning about uh, at some point in the show, we're going to have a second reading and that's completely up to you. Although you know that because you've been on the show. So you know the, the suffering that's going to come 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 your way soon, right? That's your reward for joining us. <laughs> yeah, that's that's your reward. Okay, I have one question then and I, I'm going to kind of fade back and let encourage Steve and Mike to actually participate a little more in the conversation. So Dirk, when you're writing the book, was there an opportunity to cite or reference any of Mike or Steve's work? What? Oh, um, <laughs> not a good question I, to ask of another academic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so I knew I, I knew I, was, and I had to I had to be a little bit careful with it. But I'm actually I think it can be looked at objectively. Like the reason I chose not to maybe use or refer to Steve's work was because such and such or right because the, you know that I'm really curious about that right so Dirk what, what what's no, fra thoughts? no fragile egos here Dirk so did you did you cite right. me or Mike or not and right. I don't really I'm not going to complain either way my my, my, my papers are written in a, a Polish and obscure Polish journal so they're not well known yeah that's true yeah the, <laughs> okay. the journal of Radziki yeah <laughs> okay no, my, so Dirk, I mean, the I've embarrassing question. On, yeah, yeah, no, I, I've cited Steve's work on um, how neoclassical economists um, get climate change completely wrong. 
Um, you have this paper from, I don't know, maybe through 2020, and I've cited that a lot. Um, maybe you get those emails by, by Google where you can see who, who quoted you and so on. Uh, but yeah, that's that's mm. a paper I normally reference. Um, but I, I don't know whether I did that there, but I have a chapter on the Green New Deal or a sub subsection. I'm not sure. Um, so I, I wrote that book last year and, and a lot of things have happened. So uh, I'm, I'm also be reading my own book and will be surprised uh, what I what I wrote last year. So. Yeah. So I hope that answers yeah, the, green, the, green new, the Green New Deal yeah. is really sort of in the United States anyway, the key to modern monetary theory coming on or being more widely accepted, I think. Yeah. How so? Yeah, I mean, it's it's about solving problems. Um, and what is also getting more and more attention is this idea of having a bill of economic rights. Um, there was this proposal by Alan Minsky um, for the Progressive Democrats of America. He came up with this idea mm -hmm. of, of doing a new kind of a new version of the 1944 Economic Bill of Rights from FDR. Um, and that's that's also in the book. So I think it's it's better to start with the idea that people have certain economic rights and then you're trying to think about, OK, so how can we make sure that people get access to health care at, uh, at an affordable price, which is basically kind of almost free? Um, what about free university education? Um, what about a good pension for old age? What about a decent job? Uh, and, and decent decent pay also, decent wage. So so if you start like this, you can start with practical questions and you don't have to deal with any neoclassical theoretical stuff that is normally thrown at you, like we're never gonna pay for that. So instead you you say, okay, so here's certain things that we want to achieve and we know that money can be created. So, so do the resources that we have, do they allow us to do just that? Um, so in, in that sense, it's, it's basically more about the resources in the end and, and giving income uh, to people. And it's about it's also about power, for example. So wages are, are influenced heavily by power. We have seen that also during the inflation episode on, of the last years, uh, when energy, energy prices went up, also profits went up to some extent. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's I think, a, a new way to bring in MMT and to discuss economics uh, by starting with the question, so what kind of society do we want to live in? Mm -hmm. Give us a pricing of the book, Dirk. What do you what do you cover? Just, just the basic structure and uh, sort of chapter by chapter. Oof! Uh, again, I, I wrote the book last year, um, but I start with <laughs> you've uh, forgotten with already. The, yeah, I, I'm I'm sorry, but I I published a, a German work a German textbook on on macroeconomics, yeah. and that uh, also came out last fall, and that's 250 pages. So so that was also my mind. Um, but I remember mm. that I start with Joe Biden, um, who followed the advice of, of uh, everybody who was progressive and said, OK, let's increase government spending after the pandemic uh, started. And you had the, we had the lockdowns in 2020 and there were the, the $2,500 checks, uh, I think, three times. Um, and then there were these different, uh, different programs by the government, like the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, hundreds of billions and even trillions of US dollars raining on the economy. And that was a good idea. Um, Larry Summers said in 2021 in the summer, uh, he said, well, if you want to reduce, I think there was 22. Um, he said, uh, if you want to bring down inflation, you have to create a 5% unemployment rate for five years. Uh, and, and that's a new Keynesian idea of, of the economy where you push people uh, under the bus um, so that you have lower rates of inflation because you have more unemployment and then wage growth is Short slower. Phillips right? curve idea. So, mm. Mike? Oh, I just said a short run Phillips curve idea, the trade-off. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and, explain and the idea, that you... yeah, explain yeah, explain that to everybody. I'd like, I don't want to leave that as a, a wink and a nod between the, the, the three smartest men in the room here. So three, three eggheads. <laughs> yeah. yeah sure. So please, please yeah. explain that. What I mean, it, you know, Phillips curve, we get that. So a short run Phillips curve, yeah. Mike, Dirk. Well, the the um, sort of textbook one. version and Steve will tell you uh, more about the original paper by Phillips. But the textbook version is that there's a trade off between inflation and unemployment. And if you want want more of the if you will willing to accept more of the one, you get less of the other. So every nation has to pick its mix of you know, inflation and unemployment uh, that it is is good with. And that's kind of what, there's a trade-off. And that's what apparently Larry Summers would say. Not the Larry Summers who's joining us today, though. 
Oh, don't. Maybe it is. Who knows? Okay. Or maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think we'd know pretty rapidly. I've heard of quite a few things about Larry. Larry, some of the real Larry Summers in terms of personal interactions. You know, we'd yeah. be we'd be massively pissed off at them already. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there yeah. is definitely a satirical version there. Now the I well this 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 is actually uh, a bit of an I version, but the the you see this debate amongst the the uh, mainstream right now is the the Phillips curve is dead blah 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 and what they're talking about is there is, is exactly what Mike is highlighting there wasn't this relationship between rising unemployment to reduce the inflation rate and on that basis they're denigrating the work of Phillips which they never read and if they did read it they'd never understand it so um, the basic idea that Phillips had was that there'd be more uh, the, the, the fundamental concept is that a, a high level of economic activity uh, enables uh, what he called you know, the, the usual neoclassical term, unfortunately, uh, factors of production to be able to negotiate for a higher share. And then what you get is a, you can get a wage price spiral out of that. You, but what you have basically is competing claims over the distribution of income. And that's the approach post Keynesians take, which is very different. To the neoclassicals and when you look at the most recent bout of inflation the hands down when is that particular contest where capital is putting up markups it wasn't the workers at all so if you want to you know you the, the the dead side of the curve which the mainstream has some sort of grasp on is that the inflationary event we had most recently can't be blamed on higher wages but nonetheless they're putting in the standard neoclassical cure put up interest rates and that's supposed to reduce the level of unemployment and the rate of inflation Wow, yeah, and that doesn't work anyway, because the interest rate income that the US government is paying, I think it's now a trillion dollars per year. Mm -hmm. I just checked. OK, so they pay a, a trillion dollars per year in interest income to the bondholders, which is, of course, it's a distributive effect. I mean, they, they make the rich richer. Uh, and I mean, that money normally, I, I guess that goes into real estate and other things. Um, but if it goes into real estate, it me means probably that rents are going. And rents are also part of the consumer price index. OK, so if rents go up, inflation goes up. Um, so so it's really bad policy uh, from from many different kind of perspectives. Um, and it also doesn't work. So, I mean, in uh, many economists were thinking that by by moving the interest rate up would have less investment. Um, but business and uh, business scholars are not stupid. Uh, so if, if you work in a company and there's lots of demand, for example, for electric vehicles, maybe also because of the, the subsidies, then you will not say, oh, they raised the interest rate from zero to five percent. Capital costs have increased. And given the price that I plan to put on my pro product, uh, I'm, it's not profitable anymore. So I, I just I cancel the whole investment. That's rubbish. Mm -hmm. Of course, what you do as, yeah. an, as a, a business owner is that you, you have an increase in costs. So what do you do? You, you increase the price. And everybody else has the same increase in capital costs. So, of course, everybody's just passing on the increased costs of capital and they, they raise the price of their product and they follow through. So they, the um, New Keynesians, um, when they do their economics, they, they pretend that a higher level of interest rate leads to less private investment. But if you look in the at, uh, at the data in the United States, that's not happening. So private investment is going up, not going down. Why? Because aggregate demand is strong. And that's it's, it's, and now we, we can talk about MMT. So that was always an empirical point of MMT that we say, look, the, the fiscal part of the economy is much stronger than the interest rate part. I mean, you can move interest rates up and down, but it, it really wouldn't do much to the economy. Maybe maybe something will break at eventually. Um, but there's there's examples, for example, in Sweden and so the North European country of Sweden, um, it's not probably known for high interest rates, but in 1992, they had an interest rate of 500%, 500% at the central bank. And they already decided that they would go, the next week they would go to 2,500%. They were trying to, to defend the exchange rate in the European uh, exchange rate mechanism. Um, so imagine that um, if you think that, that an interest rate of 500% uh, does does lead to an economic collapse, and then in Sweden that didn't happen. I mean, why would you talk about? Why would you think that that high interest rates lead to a collapse of the economy uh, when when you have examples like this? It's it's completely it's unimaginable. Yeah, but I, I want to talk about this this Swedish. What you said they literally had a posted overnight rate of five hundred percent. Yes, yes, and again, I, the, I, the rate, I've never the, seen that on the data before. That. What, what, how long did they hold it for? Oh, not for long. A couple of days. 
Um, there That's was, what I, I gathered. Mean, yeah, okay. We didn't have the real estate crisis, and the the foreign investors wanted out by all means, and they were not uh, willing to hold Swedish crowns anymore um, because they thought there was more coming up. And uh, the Swedish wanted to stay inside this kind of fixed exchange with the regime. And uh, the Riksbank, they have published this material on their web page, and they said that already they decided to move the interest rate to 2,500% the next week if the uh, exchange rate situation would not stabilize. Um, so they drag the exchange rate up by the huge, basically encouraging capital inflow. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the people, how would people have accessed that? But this is this is part of the mechanics, which you know I know you've covered very well in the book. How how would that if the Swedes are offering two and a half thousand percent interest, then how does that affect the um, uh, the, the uh, to, to defend the exchange rate? And what you're saying it's going to have people buying Krona to access that. So what's the mechanism that that would have done to uh, stabilize the decline in the Krona? Well, I mean, if, if you get offered uh, to buy Krona and uh, you get an interest rate of 500% or 2,500%, of course, the main thing that you need is the expected exchange rate. So if you think that the Krona will yeah. collapse anyway, then of course, it doesn't, doesn't it's not worth investing. Uh, but everybody knows that eventually the pressure will go away and it will flatten out. Um, so, I mean, in that sense, we can talk about expectations. So I, everybody knows that some people have been running away from Sweden already. They cashed out. And the question is now how many people are left and do people expect other people to run out? Um, so, so in that sense, it's a beauty contest of John Maynard Keynes where you're not guessing really what the fundamentals are, mm -hmm. but you're guessing what the fund the expectations are of other people of what, uh, what other people would think about these fundamentals or, uh, and then you are in a certain mm -hmm. degree and so on. Have... Yeah. yeah, complicated. Okay. So, what's the so go, go through some of the policy proposals you've uh, take us through the argument in that not not chapter by chapter, obviously, but the argument in the yeah. book explaining what policy implications are of MMT for the European Union. Oh, the book is on on the uh, on the dollar zone, uh, so it's just for the United States. Um, Where's that? Okay. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, so um, okay. I I published a paper with Randy Ray. Um, it was published uh, like a month ago, and that was on the ECB. Uh, where oh, okay, that's what I got confused with. The, the question, uh, what uh, what is really going on? How money is created? Um, and the ECB, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting that you can see the MMT view evolving. In the 1990s, uh, Stephanie Kelton, for example, was writing papers saying that uh, it looks like a nation state in the Eurozone is like the state of California in the United States. And that was at a time when the euro didn't exist. So, so they were just kind of trying to guess what's going on. Um, and when they introduced the euro, um, they kept the national central banks. And that's something which surprised many people because normally you have one single central bank. And most people think that the European central bank is the Europeans, the Eurozone central bank. Uh, but it's not um, just like there is a federal reserve system. We have a euro system. Uh, yeah. The euro system consists of the ECB plus the national central banks. So if you ask a German bank, for example, where do you have your account? They will say, well, at the German central bank. If you ask a Spanish bank, where do you have your account? They will say, well, um, at the Spanish central bank. And if a student mm. asks me, um, so who has an account at the ECB? Well, I didn't know, but a student really asked me that. So I asked the ECB and they, they needed mm. two weeks to come back to me. So apparently they, they have never heard the question before. And they said, look, um, at the ECB, you have an account of the European Commission, which is our kind of sort of economic government or, or European government. Uh, so European yeah. Commission, European Investment Bank, foreign central banks like the Fed and uh, RBA and so on. And then uh, they said other international organizations, um, they have the account at the ECB. So this means that the ECB sets interest rates, but they, um, they probably do, do not do a lot of money creation there. Um, because normally it's banks that borrow and also the national central banks are, are doing the bond purchase programs. So there was this big change in, in 2002 when the euro started. The ECB was not supposed to bail out any country. OK, so the idea was that mm. financial markets, they would punish those countries with deficits. OK, so if you government spend a lot of money 
and then you do it in a bad way. So not much tax revenues come back because economic activity does not increase. So you have a high deficit. Then that should translate into a high interest rate. And that forces you to spend your money in a wiser way. That was the idea. It, it's all going back to the 1990s, okay, where they saw that the communist system collapsed. So only markets work. And that means financial markets should make sure that governments spend their money right. That was the idea governance wise mm. of the Eurozone. So it was the most neoliberal central banking system that, that you could imagine. I think no other country has it. Um, well, and then the set. They, but they don't actually. So, so, the, so this, the national uh, central banks don't have accounts at the ECB? No, they don't. Okay, so that's. And that's not also, of course, private banks. What about private banks? The private banks have accounts at the ECB. No. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and that's not well. So known. it's the central bank. This, this, this is an Australian joke here, but that's why you call the Clayton Central Bank. It's a central bank you have when you're not having a central bank. So <laughs> it's they don't have a European Treasury and they don't have a central bank at the same time. We talk about a European Central Bank. Oh dear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, everything is complicated because because from the beginning the European Union was supposed to be an ever closer union. And from the 60s and 70s onwards, that meant monetary integration. Actually, all countries who are now in the European Union and don't have the euro, they will they are kind of forced to have it in the future. OK, so the European Union says that if you enter the European Union, you also enter with a pledge to join the eurozone. Eventually, you can opt out. So countries like uh, Sweden wow. and Denmark, they have opted out. But if a country, so just imagine Scotland, for example, turning independent, if they would join the European Union, they would join with a pledge of, of also joining the Eurozone. But there's no, there's, this is a, like a soft pledge. Okay, so there's no law that says inside the first 10 years, you will have to prepare, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't exist. Um, but they had to, they had to change the way that the Eurozone governance works because of the, the financial crisis. So in Europe, we had a big real estate bubble in Ireland and another one in, in Spain, and that collapsed the whole Eurozone economy. And Greece was one of the, the victims uh, because it had a lot of public sector debt. Um, so they were having a hard time selling government bonds. And in the end, they had to bail out Greece. And they were kind of on the verge of bailing out other countries by, by giving them extra money. And then Mario Draghi came and said, look, um, the ECB has to be a dealer of last resort. They have to buy up those government bonds to stabilize the price um, because other otherwise the monetary system cannot work. OK, so I think there's no central bank in the world which says we're not buying any government bonds. And if the government is running out of buyers of their government bonds, well, let them go bankrupt. Let them run out of money. Nobody's doing that. OK, so most countries are kind of open about it. So we had this change in the way that we we um, we have the ECB. So again, the dealer of last resort function was added in 2012 for all countries except Greece. But with the pandemic, Greece was also included in 2020. So this explains why the Greeks they had 210 percent of public debt to GDP as a ratio in 2020, but they did not run out of money. In 2010, they had 130 percent of debt to GDP ratio, and they did run out of money. OK, so this is because mm -hmm. of the change in the way that the ECB is kind of having the back of the governments and say, OK, we buy up those those extra government bonds. We stabilize prices and then the international investors are very happy with the Greek bonds because they offer a slightly high interest rates. And if the investors are scared, they can always sell to the ECB. So there's there's no risk. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no, no risk. It's a risk free asset. Um, yeah. And, and that's that's. Um, it's a debate that we had also with the post Keynesians, Mark Lavoie and um, other uh, scholars. Um, so, so Randy and I, we wrote a paper that uh, that hopefully clears things up, um, that the Eurozone is not the disaster that it was uh, uh, in the 2000s. So this neoliberal part of the financial markets watching over the governments, that's basically gone. It's still in the in the treaties and so on. But de facto, um, the ECB has to has decided to become a dealer of last resort because they say, well, in order to stabilize inflation, we cannot ha have countries defaulting on 100 billions of, of euros worth of government debt. So so it's it's possible for us to do it. Um, and, and that's where we are right now. 
Hey, Dirk, what does that mean um, in Greece when they run when they ran out of money? Like, what what does that what does that mean? They ran out of money. Companies that don't have access to capital, uh, the banks, the ATMs don't work. Explain to the viewers what running out of money in Greece meant. Yeah, yeah, that's that's also a very good question. Um, it's the Greek government that ran out of money uh, um, in and ten, I think it was, or it started. Um, so. Um, how can you run out of, of money? So in the US, for example, even Alan Greenspan has said that it's impossible that the federal government can always create more money if it wants to. But in the Eurozone, we have the system where we have one currency for many countries. And um, everybody was afraid that a country was would kind of misuse this kind of system and say, well, how about um, doubling government spending inside one year? Um, because we can attract, I mean, lots of European workers would be happy to work, let's say, in Greece. So if we double the wages and we double the spending, um, we can have nice doctors, medical doctors coming in from places like the United Kingdom, the Netherlands. So the United, K was, the United Kingdom was in the European Union back then. Um, but everybody was happy to have euros, even if you had pounds in the UK. Um, and in order not to, to have this kind of problem, they said, OK, so we... We create rules that when a government spends in the eurozone, then the central bank is creating that money. OK, so when the Greek government spends, the Greek central bank marks up the account of a bank which says, oh, yeah, nice. That's that's euros for us. So who's going to receive the money? And then the bank is marking up the account of the person who's receiving the money or the company. OK, so so that's what they do. So it's not that the central bank somehow gives money to the government. But the central bank creates money on behalf of it. OK, and that's um, that's how it works. And the Greek government then goes into negative balances. So when they spend, let's say, a billion euros, the balance of the Greek government at the central bank of Greece is minus one billion. They will have tax payments coming in, let's say, 500 million. And then they are in the deficit, 500 million left. And they need to go back to zero. Otherwise, the central bank is not able to make payments on behalf of the Greek government on the next day, because that's what the what the law says in the European Union. OK, so this is very interesting because often the question comes up. So why do governments issue bonds at all? It's not necessary for, for running the monetary system. Why do they do it? Well, the answer in the European Union or in the Eurozone is they have to do it because the law requires the, that the national governments bring back their account to zero and they can do that by selling government bonds. So if the Greek government sells 500 uh, million euros worth of government bonds to the banks, so there's just a couple of banks who are able to buy, then those uh, banks, they give up their reserves, the deposits that were created by the spending, they give those up and they uh, get those government bonds. And the government brings back the account for minus 500, 500 million euros back to zero. That's how it works. And, and if, the, if, the bond, if the banks don't want to buy those government bonds anymore because they think there might be no demand for them and prices might go down, then, of course, you have something like 2010. So the banks don't want to buy the government bonds. The Greek government cannot bring the account at central bank back to zero. The next day, the Greek central bank says, sorry, we cannot create money on your behalf. We have to wait until the tax money rolls in. OK, so we have to wait for the tax revenues, bringing the account back to zero. And that, of course, would stop. It would kill your economy. And that's what happened. So if you always have the ECB as a dealer of last resort saying, oh, we always buy government bonds. So if you give us about government bonds, we just mark up your account at the ECB, at the National Central Bank, sorry, at the National Central Bank. Um, then as an investor, you're not afraid that government bond prices will go down in a crisis. And that is why in the pandemic, um, the ECB and also the European Commission, they followed uh, the, the kind of MMT script. They said, OK, we, we get rid of the deficit limits for a couple of years and we turn the ECB into a full blown dealer of last resort, even for Greece. And that is why we went through the crisis uh, in, a, in a very smooth way compared to the austerity policies that we had in the 2010s. Uh, which is a big step forward, and I think we we should we should want to stop here and say, well, well done. We had some influence, and policy making improved because of that. I, I don't think they're going to last. I mean, I um, in in writing my most recent book, which is still in press, um, I took a look at the 2007 crisis compared to COVID, 
And if you look at the 2007, what you had was a whole bunch of neoclassical economists who, first of all, thought there wasn't going to be a crisis at all. And then bang, surprise, surprise, there's a crisis. And what they did, like I even spoke to Ed Lazare at one stage, and Ed Lazare was the uh, Bush's chief economic advisor. And he wrote a crazy paper called Economic Imperialism. I imagine you've seen it, Dirk. Uh, saying economists know everything, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is back in 2000. Well, 2008 or nine, when I met him, he was much humbled by the whole experience. And he actually said to me at one point, I don't know why they appointed me. I'm just a labor economist. Anyway, chief economist of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the Bush uh, government. When the, when the uh, crisis hit, like everybody else, they simply turned to their first year economics textbook, the money multiplier. Okay. Let's give banks all these extra reserves. They'll lend it out. We'll get a 10 to 1 ratio. That'll give us a boom. We'll recover really quickly. And poor bloody Obama, who, of course, only had a has training in uh, in law, not in economics, swallowed this stuff hook, hook line, and sinker, uh, went out and made a speech on that basis, literally talking about uh, a, a dollar or two a bank can create 8 or $10 of loans to households, a multiplier effect which will give a faster rate of economic growth. You look at how long it took to recover from the uh, global financial crisis. It was of the order of uh, three years before you got back to the pre-crisis level of unemployment. With COVID, it was three months. Okay? So the shortest, in, in terms of how recessions are defined, the shortest recession in America's economic history was the COVID crisis. And the reason was they gave money to households and households spent the money and bang, you had a, you know, in instant turnover and boom of money. So I think in some ways comparing the great global financial crisis to COVID is one of the best ways to show that the conventional theory of, of they're all wrong and the radical stuff is right, but they'll forget it again. They're in, busily in the process right now of forgetting those lessons. So we have some questions from uh, our, our viewers. One, uh, uh, D. Smith asked, uh, what, uh, Dirk, what do you think uh, Christine Lagarde does? What's her role? Oh, well, she's a lawyer by training. Uh, and uh, of course, it's a political role that she's playing. So she's not, uh, she was not given the, the job of ECB president because she, she knows her economics so well. Um, um, but she's, I think she's smart. And um, at Davos, um, when there was the World Economic Forum, um, she was complaining that the economists in the, at the ECB would constitute uh, a tribal clique, she said. Um, and uh, she explained that there were inflation forecasts were, were always wrong. And 80% of that is because energy prices did not enter the calculation of the expected rate of inflation. Um, and apparently nobody, nobody was kind of thinking outside of the box. So everybody had this kind of new Keynesian worldview and the, they kind of calibrated DSG models and whatnot. Um, but they forgot energy prices. And um, so, so I think Christine Lagarde is, is kind of smart and she understands that there's a, there's a problem with theory. And also in the ECB, like everywhere else, you have always, you do have cliques, okay? There's different groups of people, different kind of social networks. And um, you can find ECB working papers where they explain, for example, that the inflation rate is kind of correlating with the change in wages um, and then compensated for productivity. Um, even before the Eurozone was created. Okay, so there are knowledgeable people, even in institutions uh, where you kind of think that they are very neoliberal, but uh, I think it's, of course, they, they, they're not allowed to, to say things too openly, but there's always a lot of variety in the background. So I think that, that it's now very visible that there's different ideas than austerity economics and so on. And if people don't like that kind of economics, they can pick an alternative which is more expansionary, which is kind of like zero interest rates and the government is spending more money to fix problems instead of all this talk about deficits and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's that's an improvement. And uh, Christine Lagarde, I, I, I was quite in, an improvement. Yeah, I was quite intrigued. I think, talk, I think uh, at least historically yeah. in, in, in the U.S., there have been uh, uh, fights in, in the central bank between those who came to central banking from economics and those who came to central banking from banking. And they have right. very different sort of viewpoints and mental models. And I also note that Jerome Powell is also a lawyer, not, not an economist or or yeah. a, a banker. Yeah. Uh, and there's there's also Amanda Haran had a nice uh, question about the, the, the debt oh, ceiling. And second. from hold your comments, yeah. 
hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. We're just, I want to give a shout out. Like I've been, I've been prompted by the voice of God, who's our production manager, Ty Keens. He says, you know, we're going to cancel the show. Like, I mean, I, I had to interrupt you, Mike. I mean, this is big news. We mm -hmm. might actually just have to cancel the show completely. You know, I mean, because you haven't, you haven't promoted the show. Well, it's not my fault. Well, it is my fault, right? I mean, like, I, I got to interrupt and stuff, but I love listening to you guys, right? And I want to be, you know, it's just like we use the bar, the bar analogy. We're all sitting at the bar, and I don't want to be the guy that just jumps into the conversation. But 2,500 viewers, and we got to have more engagement here, right? We got to see more. Yeah, well, more we're, we're going to talk to Manahara in question now. So, Manahara's yeah. question. Dirk, Dirk, can you dive in and get the explanation? Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a very strange rule. This this that ceiling in the United States. Um, but apparently there's some law which says that you have a US debt ceiling. Let's say it's I don't know 30 trillion. I think by now it's probably a little bit more. So if you if you hit the debt ceiling, the um, the United States government is not able to spend anymore, um, at least officially. Um, they cannot sell any more government bonds um, because they reach the debt ceiling. So how do you get rid of this debt ceiling? Well, you normally don't get rid of it, but instead you just create a higher number. So you go from, I don't know, 30 trillion to let's say 33 trillion, and you need a majority in, in, the, um, in the House of Representatives and I think also in the Senate. So normally, I mean, normally both parties have to agree because it doesn't happen so often that both houses are um, having a majority uh, or the, the, the government normally does not have a majority in both houses. Um, so that's, um, I think that's what, what's going on there. Um, but because, uh, I think you, are, um, I mean, Mike can probably talk about it. Um, I don't know. Well, I was going to, I was going to make the point that both in the European central bank case that you were describing earlier, Dirk, and in the, in the U S it seems to me that there are all sorts of rules and restrictions written into treaties and into laws. Uh, by the politicians, I guess, uh, that represent the wrong mental model about how a fiat currency system actually works. And yet it works because they find workarounds. P pretty much the people who actually make the thing run <laughs> find workarounds. They say, all right, you're going to make us do this, fine. And, and then they find workarounds. And they're the ones who actually understand. The people who actually pull the levers and turn the dials on a daily basis to make the system work. Yep. figure out how to get around the incorrect mental models and rules and restrictions that are put on by the politicians. Yeah, I this, this is the that, real uh, dilemma. We're, surra we're surrounded by incorrect mental models. Yeah, Dirk. Yeah, I remember that Nathan Tankers, he, he dug out some uh, manners from, from Fed meetings. And he, I think he published um, some minutes. At the Fed, they were debating what would happen if there would be um, a shutdown and they said, well, one thing that we could still operate is that we accept um, we accept government bonds or so treasury bonds as collateral, even though that they are defaulted upon. OK, so that would be one solution to continue operating. So officially, of course, there's a debt ceiling and they cannot issue new bonds, but they can issue defaulted bonds. And then investors might think, well, I've got some. That's got to be some very bad news. If we can sell them off. The very bad news, Dirk. Larry, Larry Summers is on our side now, so we're going yeah, he to probably going to He just moved. switched teams. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you convinced him, Dirk. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and to celebrate, Dirk, you know what we're going to do? You know what we're going to do, Dirk? We're actually going to get you to read the top chatters list, or Dirk. Let's pull it up. Yeah. I'm doing it a little yeah. bit earlier, five minutes earlier. Go ahead, Dirk. I want you to start at Santee in the top left-hand corner. I want you to go through and give it your best read. OK, so because I'm European, you will get a different read. Um, anyway, so it's Santi, um, Brad Atherton, Joe Polito, Harry Heyman, Philadelphia, Algorithm, Philip Barnes, Rick O'Brien, Demand Better World, Ghost on the Half Shell, Alpinism Utila, Sicuri uh, Economici, Bob Leo, She Watches, TR, Downtown Christmas Tree, Wayne Macmillan, Economics in One Lesson, Django Geek, Jens Rundberg, Manaharan, Larry Summers, woo, uh, Jean Noel Avila, William Hayworth, Thomas Darlington, Johnny, Ernesto Eduardo Dombaganes, Political Economy 101, Thomas Sode, Balkansky Big, Stavros Karagiorgis, Dave Collins, Big Hammer, again, 
Gbay 088, Jim Roberts, Rob Pierce, Sun Road, Marty Summers, probably the brother of Larry Summers, and Bill Gorgon. What utility, yeah. Dirk? I got this question here. It just came in from yeah. John Watson. What utility does MMT have in a world economy that has increasing energy costs? Does MMT in this environment not inherently crowd out private industry from claims on energy inputs? Kind of, yeah, definitely. But uh, please give your explanation. Yeah. Okay. So let me start with an example of uh, Sweden. Uh, so in Sweden, they have uh, a lot of cheap energy. Um, which is in the north of the country. So it's mostly powered um, by uh, um, hydro, so hydropower. Um, and there's no, there's no networks. So the north of Sweden is not connected by network to the rest of Europe. So if they generate a lot of power uh, in winter, for example, uh, or when the snow is melting after winter and spring, maybe there's lots, gonna, lots of power. And if there's lots of power, then power will be cheap. Okay. So um, the price of energy will be low and it has nothing to do with the monetary system. It's just that there's an abundance of, of a resource in that sense. So there's lots of energy and then you don't have increasing energy costs. Um, if you do have increasing energy costs, then you can increase supply. So if your government spent a lot of money to use resources to build a, a better and more sustainable energy supply, then of course the, the energy costs can come down even though government spending goes up. So in Spain, for example, they, they had an energy price, um, which was, I think, um, I think was two euros per, I don't know what it was, the unit. Uh, but in, in France, for example, it was 60. Okay, so, so electricity two days ago was 30 times more expensive in France compared to Spain. Well, because they had a lot of shun, sunshine on that day and they have lots of solar power in Spain. Okay, so... So the monetary system is, is something else uh, than the, the energy thing. And we have to spend money in a way that we have sustainable energy provision, hopefully somewhere close. So in a friendly country or inside your country. So I'm not talking about autarky here. So if you are inside the European Union, it's okay to have an EU kind of electricity market. And then if the cheap energy comes from Spain all the way through to France, for example, that's completely fine. Um, but if you if you get your energy from places where you have dictators and they are kind of hostile to your country, <coughs> Russia, then of course um, it's not a good idea to have uh, energy provided by that country. So, so yeah, I mean MMT is is in a theory that it can explain how money is created and how money is spent and how it circulates in the economy. Um, but if you want to go beyond and want to understand what kind of investments you need to make in order to have stable energy costs. You need to talk to, to scientists who are producing those kind of electricity generation plants. Yeah, but I, um, yeah, but I think there's actually, there's an, yeah. there's, there's, there's an interesting side question here. Um, <clears throat> and that is that an MMT is explaining how you can gener you know, generate government net spending uh, to finance provision of long-term assets. Of which the mainstream believes the government can't do that because they've got to borrow money from the private sector and then the repayment costs can inhibit uh, both inhibit uh, the government itself and they also crowd out as the expression john used there a moment ago but we're in a, we're in a very different world now with the global warming and with the decline in the energy efficiency coming out of oil uh, and you know, i'm seeing quite a bit of work arguing that we're reaching the point where oil is no longer an energy source the cost of getting energy out of the ground is so great mm -hmm. oil out of the ground not coal coal's cheaper but of course far more polluting but the cost of getting oil out of the ground is becoming so great in energy terms that you're no longer getting a you're no longer getting a, a, a unitary uh where you, you've got to get much more than one uh, unit of energy out for each unit of energy you put in to be able to sustain an advanced civilization and on oil, we are uh, approaching the point where you're no longer getting that positive, that excess return. There is no energy return. Now you get to that point, MMT can't solve anything. Nothing can solve anything. You've got to, you're not in, you're not in a economic problem. You're in a, you're in a, a, a predicament. Um, and that's where we're, we're getting to. So if we get to that world and we find we've got to reduce energy consumption, then I think actually there's a larger role for MMT out of that because many, many private organizations will be unprofitable. Mm -hmm. if, if you can't actually make a profit uh, by buying energy, you know, getting it out of the ground effectively cheaply and then 
making a profit by inviting it in goods and services, you're going to go bankrupt uh, if you rely upon the private credit system. And, uh, and so I think that MMT actually has a larger role, but it's a role in which you're going to say we, we have to provide uh, you know, enough resources to keep people alive. So this is more the sort of basic income, basic services argument. Um, but you, you are no longer in a world where you can simply just, you know, use MMT's capacity to create resources, to build power stations, to extract the power. Uh, two reasons. One, there's no longer net, net power coming out of oil and gas. And secondly, uh, we need to reduce our footprint on this planet, not increase it. Uh, but in that particular case, if the private financial system can't survive, then government money creation is uh, about the only way to go. Tom uh, Hickmore kind of brought up something that I thought was kind of ridiculous, but I'm going to throw it up there and say, <laughs> what are we doing? Well, there actually has been some talk at the show to say, hey, we'd love to get some more female guests to come on. And so if you're a female guest, uh, if you're a, a listener and, and uh, you've got something con to contribute, then reach out to the show. Reach out to myself. No, we've got a few. We've, we, we've had a few before. Like, and had a few, yeah. was thought, But we've, it's, it has been with definitely that's that's. Uh, a definite weakness in the show. We get to get Kate Raworth on here. Get yep. um, Stephanie, uh, Isabella Maybe. Weber. Uh, you know, there's uh, and Anne's been here. We've had Anne so far. Yeah, so that's got a, quite a few more. Okay, so that's a bit to the back room there. We've got to get a definitely improve the the male female ratio. And of course, Stephanie Kelton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, I have something for you. Oh, well, actually, no, let's see what Lana has to say. Hey, folks, so glad to see almost, yeah, 2,500 viewers, right? So if I forget to do my job and pump the show, Lana, you know what? You're lovely, sweetheart, and we we, we love you very much. Thank you for your support on the show. Um, so anyways, yeah, my question is this. I, I, I'm wondering if a um, more accepted and ubiquitous understanding of money and modern monetary theory in nations around the world would actually do something to upset the, the balance of power between uh, uh, federal authorities that basically have, um, I guess, the, the first right of refusal or have access to that power versus um, uh, state or provincial governments, uh, municipalities even, you start going down that power chain of political structure and a, a, a municipality is a corporation, for example, and you know they, they look at the capacity of this this godlike entity that is the government of Canada or the or you know Australia uh, or um, uh, United States and they say how, how we can't print our own money. We're just an underling and now it, it affects that power structure. Consider the United States, for example, with the enormous amount of power that each particular state has. So how do you like how do you negotiate that power where one has like an ability to to tap into that money creation and the others the others don't? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a very good question because most of the stuff that we see that is public is is local. Okay, so we send our children to a public school here in Berlin, for example. Um, I uh, I use a public road. There's, I use a public transport system. I just used it today as a subway, for example. So all of this stuff, of course, is delivered by local local uh, government, um, by municipal government. And Berlin is also a city state, um, but it's uh, it's not the capital. So it's not the federal government which is paying for stuff here in Berlin. And when you have these conversations with people who are uh, at that kind of level, they, of course, say, well, but we are a currency user. So so we can we can only spend if before we, we have have some kind of income. So tax revenue or they borrow yeah. money from a bank. They have to do that before. And um, they also use, uh, by the way, they use also the German central bank's accounts. Uh, so that's that's not different. Um, so, but what I tell them is like, look, if, if you need more money and if you are over indebted in your, in your communities and, and you can, you have to close the, the public swimming pool or, or something, um, then you have to talk to the, to the higher level. So you have to talk to the federal government. Um, and in Germany, for example, we have lots of communities who are over indebted and there is now a debate about what the federal government can and should do to make that this kind of debt go away because you are creating also these kind of cycles of poverty. So if you have shitty infrastructure, 
then of course people will move away because they notice and they they like they prefer to live elsewhere and then house prices come down which means you get more poor people coming in who are who want to rent a cheap flat which is kind of okay of course that's what they're doing but that means if you, if the neighborhood is more and more poor then real estate prices go down some more even more people move away and that means you get this structure this geographical structure where the rich move towards where the rich are and the poor move where the other poor are uh, and this of course it's kind of creating a new kind of society where where you have not everybody living inside a quarter of a town um, but where you have segregation by by rich and poor and you can see that going on in slow motion in countries like germany uh, and also in countries like spain for example and it, here in europe we we didn't have that before and um, it's it's really causing a, a a big problem so so yeah i mean we are we have this european union idea of of having the same kind of quality of life everywhere it's the same for the federal federal republic of germany that you should have a good life wherever you live inside germany and you need to do something about it and and that something is the fiscal part um the german government the federal government has to give some more money to these those communities with more with those debts or you can put tax raising powers in the hands of those states of germany for example or the cities um but yeah i mean these are very big discussions about about institutional structure i i didn't quite understand how it went from a, a question of uh, of of power realignment right i want to get into that again here to yeah. the distrib distributed pockets in geography of like rich and poor neighborhoods or something like that i i want to try and stay away from that i want to focus really on this this what seems to me a an inherent um not command but centralized economy right like the movement towards a a more it seems like innate in the theory itself it moves to more centralized power and i don't know if there's anything addressing that it may be for public good it may be for more public good but in reality what i'm hearing is that this is this is actually stacking the deck on 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 the sides of of a centralized policy driven not necessarily government. not 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 necessarily no, no. i mean i think we, we need to look back and see i, I think that if you go back to the 1950s uh really after the second world war um then you had a desperate need to reconstruct europe obviously and a strong focus on the good society in america and one of our colleagues i can't remember his name right now to coin the phrase of the uh, 50s and 60s of the golden age of capitalism and you didn't have this hang up about whether the government should have a deficit or not they're running deficits pretty much all the time because that's how the second world war itself was financed and that was common knowledge at that stage it's been driven out by 50 years of neoclassical garbage but that was common knowledge and so what you had was because the government was spending more than it was bringing back in taxation and because the government was also building lots of infrastructure and public resources and so on that enabled a decentralized economy in the sense that there was plenty of cash around. People didn't have to borrow money uh, from the private sector to have money to spend. It was there from the government money creation. And you had, uh, you know, distributing the state's capacity to create the money was distributing money throughout the entire economy. And therefore you get have economic act activity over the entire system. When you got to stage where it was privatized, uh, you know, the, the neoclassicals taking over, less government spending, more private borrowing and so on. Uh, you ended up having actually a, a, not so much centralised, but more unequal. You still got the wealth in Washington, but look what they did to Detroit. Yeah, so yeah that's think, a great answer, yeah. Steve. I, I'm curious, though, how do you delineate between politicising or putting conditions on that money, right? I mean you know you can have one political party that's that's advocating well, that's partly for... the problem you you you, you have the, the power of mmt is well and truly used to drop bombs on 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 uh on on uh, the frills of ukraine to give the israelis more weapons than they need uh and and etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, to invade iraq okay in australia's case to prop up ridiculous house prices so mmt is well and truly you know used in one sense by the state but it's used for positively anti-social reasons and that the, the, one of the great frustrations i know dirk feels this as well a bit of a talk about it um where you never get asked about whether there's whether there's money available to make bombs or to cause yeah. house price bubbles or to support them you always ask whether it's for education or health or welfare 
So yeah. that's the social class side of the of the way MMT is used. Yeah, yeah. Derek, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, we in Germany we are a federal republic, and that means that the government is paying the federal government is paying for some things, but for example, education is paid for by the state. But of course, you can have arrangements where, for example, the federal government says, well, half of the tax revenue that we collect with some kind of tax, we give to the state. Or the federal government could say, well, we pay the, the pensions and you don't have to pay for that. So, so there's always a debate who is paying for that and at what kind of level do we organize it? So some stuff is federal, mm -hmm. like national pensions. But things like education, elementary schools and kindergarten and like that kind of stuff, that's local level. But you can have local level organization being paid for by the government, the federal ones. So the federal government might say, we guarantee uh, a kindergarten place for every child in this country and we're going to pay for it. But it's going to be organized locally. And, and to some extent, I think that is I, I'm not sure whether we have done that in Germany, but I, I think it's still paid by the state. But we could do that at any point. Also, we have, of course, a lot of costs um, because migrants from Ukraine have, have come to Germany. And then who pays for that? So do the states pay for that or the municipalities? Or does the federal government pay for that? Or is there some kind of co-financing? Of course, these are very important political debates. And MMT is making this very transparent and says, look, this matters. It, the federal government should pay for the refugees from Ukraine. Why, why should local communities pay? I mean, in some communities, there's no migrants and some communities, there's lots of them because they like to be, I don't know, in Berlin or something, um, because we already have a community of Ukrainians here. So why should Berlin pay for it? Um, so it might make sense to, to think about having a, a federal uh, solution here. Um, so these also, I mean, the power to raise taxes, for example, I mean, if you if you look at this history of the United States, I mean, yeah, that was always going on to that the states want to erase their own taxes, but the federal government, of course, wants to keep the power. And, and these are very crucial political questions. And if you look at political science, you will find lots of debates uh, about those kind of questions. Who's going to pay for it and who should do the organizing? Um, so I think MMT makes this much more transparent. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think Lana brought up the point. There's nothing to rally for, but I think there is something to rally for. I think we've subtly been banging that beat drum, Steve and I, and probably Dirk, I want to hear your thoughts on, on the on the climate reality uh, here next. But, you know, I mean, there is something to rally about. And it's just, we it falls on deaf ears. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, what is the tipping point for um, public approval? And I think Steve um, very aptly gave the metaphor of the hot stove and putting your hand on it we got to be burnt so dirk what are what are your thoughts about the climate reality and what we face and uh the the opposing forces of of economic growth prosperity and the reality of where we need to do to to be um resource conservative yeah yeah i think that that we are at a tipping point probably um there's a lot of pushback right now because people have seen that um, that we are going, we are, we are on this trajectory that we're kind of addressing the problem. It's it's happening slowly, but it's happening here in the European Union, for example. We have this, this European uh, Green Deal, um, which is not a Green New Deal. Um, so it's not what we what we argued for. So I, I was a co-author of the uh, Green New Deal for Europe in 2019, which was more comprehensive, um, where we also su suggested these kind of things that Europe pays for it, and then you you... Uh, decide locally, for example, what kind of infrastructure you would like to see in transport systems, for example. Um, yeah, but I mean, there's now a lot of pushback from the conservatives because they, I think they see that they are losing the argument. And in, in Europe, you can also see that the conservatives are switching from conservative ideology to populist right-wing ideology because they run out of arguments. I mean, the science, the science is clear. It's really clear. So the only way you can fight the science is by appealing to emotion and finding these rubbish topics and trying to go against foreigners, trying to go against, I don't know, uh, I mean, yeah. tr trying to reinvent this taxpayer money myth. Um, but this kind of ideology we cannot afford and they cannot afford. So so in uh, in Germany, for example, we have a federal uh, the federal government. We have a liberal finance minister, and he says because we have lower tax revenues this year, we will have them. 
uh, we need to cut government spending the next year. And uh, his party is polling at 3%. Okay, so next last elections, they had 14%. So, so they are trying to fight the old fight using right wing popular arguments and trying to, to use the taxpayer money miss to, to curtail government spending because they think, and it's really what they still think, it's they're kept in the 20th century, they think governments are inefficient. So keep government small and the economy will grow. It's ideology, but it's there's, there's nothing theoretical there. It's just they just assume uh, that this is so, and the numbers are horrible. Economic growth is not there. Productivity growth is not there. Unemployment is starting to increase. People are fed up by the lack of public services and the quality, the bad, bad quality of train services, for example. So normal people, they they understand what things look like on the ground. Okay, so things mm. I mean. Public investment here in Germany is, is net zero for the last 20 years, roughly. Okay, we had a couple of spikes every every once in a while. But the, thing, the, the infrastructure is crumbling away uh, and people see that. And, uh, and that's what's going what's gonna to lead to our victory. Okay, because people see that, that the, the um, climate change is coming. We have more and more, um, more and more water, more and more flooding, more and more rain, um, all kind of things. Might might go wrong with the Atlantic circulation. Um, I think that's clear. Um, but we need we need this this one more political push to get these people out of the conversation who are just lying about climate change and who are paid by. Well, by dirty, we, dirty we, again, we talked about deluded ideas ruling us beforehand, and I'm afraid they apply in both cases. Like Australia, is my my home country has now got a, a, a progressive government in charge, but they're the guy who's the Jim Chalmers, who's the uh, responsible Labor Party minister, uh, is somebody who believes the surplus is a good thing. And you say, hey, we've managed to achieve a surplus, yada, yada, yada. And so even though people end up not voting for them ultimately because you get a degrade, degrading public services, and you see you see the symptoms of the uh, applying this policy in a real economy, they still believe the cause is different to what it actually is. And so it's incredibly hard to shift that debate. And I see the same thing in climate change, frankly. You, you and I can see it and we'll talk about it and be, you know, aware that it's coming to a, it could reach a catastrophic point very soon. And we have to prepare before the catastrophe. But most people think it's just about this, you know, a warmer day in the winter. And uh, they're still swallowing the bullshit that economists put out, which I, you know, have been trying to pull apart. But it's amazing how reassuring noises are more important than decent analysis. I think the populist response that Dirk is actually talking about is is um, a reaction to, I mean, not really understanding how to participate in an arena of of intellectual discourse, right? You could even say, yeah. at a fundamental level, you could say a, a, a philosophical argument, and that what that means is that I can actually take on a conversation where I can empathize with Dirk's perspective, I can empathize with Steve's perspective, and I can also empathize with a libertarian. And I can say, what, you know, what's the good in each one of these uh, particular scenarios here? And I just see that we have such a, what pot with the populist approach does is this is a grab for power, the very, the very issue that a, a right wing conservative um, political party would make of the left political party of the the left is that their policies are just there to grab uh, power. So what is the reaction for for the Conservative Party? Well, you know, let's gravitate to the lowest common denominator, which is, uh, you know, populist talking points. And, you know, I think it's uh, what's in it for me, what's in it for the voters? Right? I think, you know, this is what, you know, people are looking for. And I, I, I see the, the trajectory of a fiscally responsible government is not taking into account the fact that it's absolutely essential to 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 talk about degrowth. So if degrowth is a part of the model, then who's shutting down and not using the reserves? Uh, I mean, energy reserves. Who's who's saving? Who's got it. We're going that? the directly We're going opposite, opposite direction. Way. Yeah, yeah. So, Jack, what's uh, you're going to ask me each question, sort of German question here to some extent? Inevitably, of course. What's what's happening with the shutdown of nuclear power and the opening up of coal stations in Germany on that very point? Well, I mean, the the nuclear power stations they are they are still shutting down, so there's no change in plans. Um, and um, I mean, 
after what happened in Japan and in, in Fukushima, um, like, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, uh, I don't think we will go back to, to nuclear. Um, and it also, it would take, it would probably uh, take more than 10 years to build a nuclear power plant, just one. <laughs> okay, so so I think it's, it's too late. It's also too costly. I mean, um, renewable energies now are so cheap um, that I don't think that, that nuclear power really is an option. Um, and the coal, I mean, yeah, the coal stations are still there firing them up. So they, I think they delayed the, the exit of, of coal uh, by a couple of years. I think now it's 2035, which uh, is a bad idea. But here in Berlin, for example, most of the electricity comes from burning coal, 85% of it, if not mistaken. So if you drive a Tesla in Berlin, know, that energy comes just... from, from burning coal. That has got to be the stupidest decision ever. I mean, I know that it was taken on you know, supposedly environmental grounds, but uh, you know, so far as I'm aware, the nuclear power stations in Germany aren't in an earthquake zone, aren't near the coast, which is the case with Fukushima, and had what? How many? Another 15, 20 years of of likely life, and now they, they just we need to reduce our carbon dioxide uh, into this planet, planet into the atmosphere. Germany shuts down the nuclear power stations and is forced to open up coal-fired power stations. You know, I mean, it's. I know I talk about the government, you know following a false ideology and, and fucking up all the time. But this is one time that the false ideology involves progressive ideas, you know, carbon, the, the anti, anti-nuclear anti waste aspect and you know, the potential for a China syndrome, none of which applies to modern reactors. So, well, I'm, I'm not the expert on energy, but, but I think that you cannot just switch on and off nuclear power well, plants. You can't. So, um, no, just you, now that they yeah, switch you, them off, yeah. it would take years to to get them back to bring them back on. But, yeah. I, th I think it actually wouldn't be quite that long because if, you know building one absolutely takes too long at the moment with the modern well, modern designs. Well, uh, but if, yeah, if uh, be, recommissioning would be a huge huge job. But I'd rather that than more bloody coal fired power stations opening up. There's also some innovation on uh, like micro. Um, uh, nuclear, right? I've seen some some innovations on micro micro nuclear um, installations. I think the innovation came out of the United States, and there's people still working on it and and stuff like that. With, I guess, marginal waste, minimal. No, waste. no, I mean, it's, it's called molten salt molten salt salt reactor, which Rodrigo has just mentioned up in the in the chat there. I mean, the hassle is that um, the regulatory uh, confines are so enormous. Uh, that the, the process of getting it approved, uh, those designs, uh, is going to delay how, how quickly they can be brought into into practice. So that's that's a whole different discussion. We should actually bring somebody on who's both in, who's got knowledge in the nuclear power area. My sympathies have been drifting towards nuclear. I've got to mm -hmm. say, from what I learned from my engineer colleagues in this area, um, but at the same time, my main argument for, for solar is not that it's cheaper, but that it's more distributed. And if we're going to have a collapse in the complexity of societies, then we need more distributed power. And it's rather easier to distribute solar, even with all the limitations I know apply there, than it is to distribute nuclear reactors. So it's a, uh, we're caught in a whole range of dilemmas. Yeah. Dirk, uh -huh. are, you, are you on a similar pathway uh, in terms of, uh, you know, somewhat bullish on the uh, on nuclear and also supportive on on uh, the solar approach? Well, I mean, in the European Union, we have countries like Sweden, where uh, I think 90% of energy generation is already sustainable. Um, and I don't think it includes nuclear. So I think that inside the next couple of years, solar power and, and energy, uh, solar energy is so, so cheap and also wind energy is so cheap uh, that again, it, it doesn't make sense to to bring back nuclear power. That's that's my point. Um, we have those power grids. We have to have batteries to to make sure that we have. I mean, we have these spikes. Sometimes we need a lot of energy, and if there's no wind and if there's no sun, then of course we need we need something. Normally, we use gas power plants, um, and we use coal. Um, but I I have to admit that Steve probably is more of an expert in this area than I am. Um, so, so that's just my perspective. But I'm, I'm. We're going to be an amateur, but I, but I, I, I listen I'm, to the engineers on that front. Yeah, uh, Dirk, just yeah. tell us a bit about uh, again for people who weren't here for the last time you're on. Tell us your journey into becoming a a, a, a non-orthodox economist and MMT up. Yeah. Okay. It was all a big, uh, a big uh, 
um, accident, let's say. Um, so I, I was studying at a neoclassical university in Göttingen, you know, uh, Germany. And then I, I did a PhD on economic geography. So I was thinking about how multinational companies would influence local firms with vertical linkages and FDI spillovers. It's uh, all of this economies. Let me not go into the details. Um, but as we built, it kind of suggested that firms would move to regions where you have low unit labor costs and also falling unit, unit labor costs. And um, we, we tried to check whether this is true. So we applied it to Nordic countries like Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Baltic countries um, like um, yeah, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And we figured out that, that it didn't work. The model didn't work. The predicts were completely wrong. Firms like to go where United, unit labor costs go up and not down. Why? Because that means there's going to be higher wages. If there's higher wages, there's more income. And that's attractive to firms because there's a lot of demand. So, so I thought, okay, I have to understand money and then introduce money into these economic geography models. And then I found Richard Koo and Axel Lehnefurt and a couple of heterodox people. I found Steve Keen. I read his book, Debunking Economics. Uh, otherwise, I would have probably tried to write something like this. So thanks again, Steve, for writing <laughs> that book. Uh, so I went straight to MMT and tried to explain to people how money works. Um, yeah, and that's... That's how I met. I met Randy Ray and I met Stephanie Kelton in 2012 from Berlin. I saw the stuff online first when Randy was writing the primer in 2011. It was published on New Economic Perspectives. And ever since, I, I consider myself a heterodox economist. Yeah. Anyway, Stephen Hinton's correcting you here on, on uh, Sweden, saying it's 50-50 uh, hydro and nuclear. So, in fact, it's undermining oh, part okay. of your nuclear argument earlier there. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, there was a, a day like two days ago that they had uh, they had one day where they had lots of hydro and, and solar power, apparently. Um, but I mean, it's in every every day you have a different kind of mix. Um, but 50, 50, I mean, 50 nuclear sounds a little bit high for Sweden, to be honest. But yeah, maybe we can check after the show and, and publish something on Twitter or so. Uh, Thanks anyway. Yeah. So, so what's I the, mean, what's... Sorry. no, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, I, I... Yeah, I just was okay. trying to fill just, a little just, bit of the blank space there. I was going to ask Dirk to again to get back and say what have you what are you arguing in the book about policy? What do you, what what are proposals have you put forward? I said it in Germany earlier. Now I realise, of course, I was talking about America for that book rather than your paper for the ECB. So, what's the American yeah. prescriptions you've given? Well, there's the the Green New Deal, uh, which includes the job guarantee, and then there's also the Economic Bill of Rights. Um, which would mean that the government should be involved in making sure that people have have their uh, their housing, which is affordable, have their health care, which is affordable. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm not going to. I didn't go very deep down that road because the book is not about that. Um, and also um, both Stephanie Kelton and Randy Ray, they have written books um, on MMT and how to save America, for example, by Randall Ray from, I think, last year. Um, mm. that's a much more detailed proposal of where to go with MMT in the United States. I try to, to more or less, um, show to, to policymakers and public sector people, um, how do you, how should you think about the monetary system? How should you think about resources? What is the role of public policy and what is your role also implied? I mean, many, many public servants believe that, that they need those tax revenues to finance the government. Um, but it's it's really not the case. So I mean, back in the 1980s when I was little, the the prices for for public transport were very low because there were huge subsidies on public transport. And now those companies uh, they seem to think that they have to generate money for the local government, and they have high prices. And when I when I take the bus here in Berlin, I pay two euro fifty to go like two or three kilometers. Uh, two euro fifty that's a quite a lot of money. I mean that's uh, I mean, I mean, I'm in a bus with with 30 other people. That should be a lot cheaper, okay? So I'm trying to to make people understand what money is and how it works in politics, and then they can maybe maybe change their their paradigm, change the the frame of reference that they have when they plan public policy. That's the hope that I have. But it it doesn't go deep down into this kind of idea like like politically what is necessary now in the United States. Okay, I we, before we started, I had. Uh try having a go at me saying people won't read godly tables to understand the monetary systems. How did you try to get policymakers to understand it? What what tactics did you use in the book? Well, I, I use mostly logic. 
um, and stories. So I, I have a whole chapter, for example, on the monetary system of Virginia. So there's a paper um, that is published, has been published by a historian, Farley Grubb, and he talks about the, the colony of Virginia back in 1760. Uh, and they issued their own colonial script, the Virginia Pound. And when they wanted to build a bridge, they, they printed a thousand Virginia Pound. And then they, they asked people to, to sell them material like stone or rock uh, and also work workers. Um, and those people who, who were interested in paying the poll tax, they contributed to, to building these kind of things. Um, and of course, I, I use the historical example of Virginia as a, as a background. And then I, I turn this into a more modern example because, I mean, back in Virginia, that was really a bad society. Only the, the white male landowners were allowed to vote anyway. Okay, so only they were, uh, were kind of getting those tax liabilities. And of course, then I open up and say, look, if we, if we understand the role that, that government money place in the society that first you have to impose tax liabilities and that you have to decide what to do with those resources. It's really up for the government to decide what is part of the government sector and what, what part you leave to the private sector. So public transportation, for example, is, is a classic um, where you can, at the government, you can just provide a public transportation system or you can say, well, I create a couple of laws and regulations and then I have private bus companies, for example. It's really up to you. Um, so, so I'm trying to use these historical examples because, because the cash system of Virginia, um, I think it was already mentioned, um, now we have this, this kind of two-tier system. You have banks and reserve accounts at the Fed, and you have normal people and corporations who, are, who own bank deposits, which are basically promises of payment in US dollars, but they're not the real thing. Okay, so there's an exchange rate between bank deposits and real US dollars. And normally it's one to one, but in times of crisis, it might change. Um, so I, I kind of hope that I can persuade people by going back in history and, and talking about this very easy to understand cash system. The, it's also very nice that in Virginia, you know what they did with the tax revenues when they collected those? They burned them. I okay, literally they did burn them, them did they? Yeah. So it was cheaper to was print it? the money again in the capital than to collect all the money and bring it back to the capital. So they, the tax collectors burn the money. And that's, I try to use uh, these kind of stories and metaphors to, to, to nail these, these certain points. And now also I, I understand, I mean, everybody understands now, I mean, everything's digital. So it's, it's about digital money creation. And that means somebody will credit an account and we should stop talking about printing the money and all of that. That's, that's not the 21st century. Um, so, Just, so that's what yeah, I'm that, trying to do. That's actually quite good because you actually literally had the money being burnt and then just rent, print the new ones and distribute those out again. That's a bit like gazellian money, isn't it? Only a very heavy form of gazellian money, the money degrades. Sorry, what kind of money? Gazellian. You know gazelle's idea for money? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, this good yeah, stuff yeah. that was used in the Great Depression. Yeah. Yeah he, yeah, yeah, he had a kind of tax on money. So the money lost 10% of its value, uh, nominal value every year. Um, by yeah. the way, I, I see somebody in the comments from the Netherlands. I have another book coming yeah. out also in the Netherlands, um, but maybe we'll, we'll do that in another show. Um, it's roughly no, the talk, same talk book. talk about book. it. Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm living yeah. So what's that book? Yeah, it's, it's a small introduction to MMT. So that's a 60-page book. It's coming out uh, in April tense in the Netherlands. It's in Dutch. And um, I think it was it was necessary to do this because in, in the Dutch parliament, Jason Hickel was invited to talk about degrowth and what would be necessary. And then somebody was asking the question, but where's the money coming from? And he said, well, yeah, you have to ask MMT this question. Um, and there was nothing in Dutch. So um, so I um, one of my former students at Maastricht University summer school course, she said she yeah. would make a translation um, of that book, and then we 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 got a publisher to to publish it. So, yeah. Oh, good. Anyway. I wish I could read Dutch. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's kind of close to you, German, but not close enough. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. certainly spend enough time in Amsterdam, Steve, and you were there. But now I can tell by the background that you're no longer there. Why don't you give the audience a little bit of? Uh, no, I'm actually in Amsterdam. Out. This is this is my wall without a bookcase behind me in Amsterdam. So. Uh, oh. Yeah, I was actually I've kind of finished up in Budapest about uh, two weeks ago, so I'm back in Amsterdam again, and I might actually 
uh, make some uh, connections to see whether I can give a, a couple of talks here. If I've got the, uh, the local university asked me to uh, get involved in the uh, the discussion they have on a regular basis, so I might uh, I might finally get back and do that again now that I'm back over here again. And what discussion is that? Did they have on a regular basis? Would you say? It's 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 forgot. It's it's Walter Chesterfield Couch. That's all I can remember. Oh, I've spoken nice. there once yeah, before yeah, yeah. at the university, and they basically uh, they have anybody who's passing through Holland. Uh, the students will grab to have a discussion. Two or three students interview on a on a Chesterfield couch, and uh, the audience a couple of hundred there. And I declined. I, I, they invited me when I was in England, and then it turned out they they don't have a budget to fly people in. It's just it happens. Anybody happens to be in Amsterdam, they'll they'll get you to come and talk there. So I've let that slip for six months since I've been in uh, in Budapest, but I'm now back here permanently. So I better do something about it. Yeah. So for for people that don't know, I mean, maybe everybody does know, but what is the Chester? What is the Chesterton couch? It's after um, Mr. Chesterton, the the academic. Just a field, just a field couch. No, it's, yeah. it's just a field. Yeah, it's 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 just it's it's. Couch. I don't know why they're comfortable. It's a the couch which is leather with uh, lots of very t tight buttons to hold the 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 stuffing in and you have a whole series of bumps everywhere and it's apparently very popular in conservative circles and i don't know whether students use that as a satire or not but that's where you sit when you have your conversation i'll be told that the real larry summers has actually sat on that couch uh along with um uh, marilyn albright and uh and bill clinton and a few others being interviewed in this series so i might give that a try i'm, I'm probably Dirk, how... be... go ahead. Yeah. okay yeah go, go, you go dan Oh, I was going to say there's there's something more to the Chesterton Chesterton couch uh, Chesterfield couch, um, and I, I I might be mixing some things up, but there's a famous econ there's a famous literary figure, and it and it has something to, I think it has something to do with having your argument and moving um, as close to that argument as possible, right? So that 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 moving a large way ideologically, for example, away from uh, um, an idea, you, 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 you need to kind of like stay in the couch sort of thing. I think, I think there's some, have you guys heard anything about that? Doesn't uh, I'm afraid I'm with, I can't help, can't help it with the couches. And Larry, Larry told us he can't get back anymore because he's running in the buff to Amsterdam through my wooden shoes. Uh, they wouldn't even notice you, Larry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. You need to do something more radical, like wear a three-piece suit to be noticed in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's yeah. what's the next what's the next project, Dirk? For you, in terms of uh, writing, it's been quite prolific. Yeah, um, yeah. The next the next thing is a textbook uh, for the U.S. So actually, I completed that in 2019, and then I lost uh, contact with the publisher, probably because of COVID or something. And uh, and then Springer approached me for a German textbook. And that is why I did that first. But the the American version is is basically finished. So I only need to update that because it's from roughly 2019. So a lot has happened since then. Uh, but I hope that next year I can I can publish it uh, for the United States. Um, and that will be almost 300 pages. Um, so yeah, that's going to be the, ne the next big project. But there will also be the Leeds conference um, in July, it's the mid, mid of July. Yep. Um, where uh, Warren Mosler is trying to, uh, or we talk a lot about Warren Mosler's contribution to MLT. I mean, he's the inventor. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. So I also try to, to um, yeah, uh, come up with some some nice thoughts for that conference, hopefully progressive thoughts. Uh, have you have you submitted your abstract? It was actually due yesterday. Uh, oh, no, uh, Warren, Warren invited me. Um, for, oh, okay. Uh, you didn't have to submit an abstract. Okay, so you'll be there as an invited guest. Okay. Yeah. I went through the abstract route. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll let him know. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I, have think, it. I think it'll I, be accepted. I have it here. I have it. I had to do a little bit of a lookup. And it was the paradox of the fence or Chesterton's fence, not couch. So it Yes, I was wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. Different kind of argument. The principle is that one should not remove a fence before understanding why it was put up in the first place, although it's about fences and not. Uh, uh, sorry. So sorry. Yeah, that's that's kind of the idea. So could we in that theme talk a little bit about um, neoclassical and before we rip it all down? What was it intended and what has it done? What has it done? That's good as opposed to 
just tear down? What, what are you guys' thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just like pulling teeth uh, with Steve on that. He's like, nothing, tear it all down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that's, that, that raises the pluralism issue. Dirk, do you use the argument of pluralism in favor of supporting teaching MMT, or are you more radical than that? Well, um, when, when it comes to pluralism, I'm all completely happy to see neoclassic economics being taught in the history of economic thought course. Um, but I don't yeah. see that, that somehow we should stay in this neoclassical frame and then add MMT to it. No, no. And that's not what we're doing. So in Australia, I'm also part, I'm teaching in this program, which uh, Stephen Hale created, um, which is the uh, Economics of Sustainability. And there we do degrowth, we do MMT, but we don't do any neoclassical stuff. Um, so, yeah, so I am yeah. on again. I mean, I, that, that, came up, that came up recently through, uh, you know, you, you know uh, Louis-Philippe Rochon, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I, I read his yeah, book. Raise the whole issue of pluralism, and like I, when I was in the academic sector, a regular thing you'd argue is in favour of pluralism, meaning we should hear neoclassical and non-neoclassical approaches. But when you look at it in terms of the genuine history of economic thought and the development of a science and so on, there's no reason to teach that bloody paradigm. It's about as realistic as the gist on the heat, the Ptolemaic model for astronomy. It's a waste of bloody time to be teaching it. And the only reason we talk about pluralism is because they still run the universities and they run the uh, the textbook machines, of course, and they run the um, uh, you know, central banks and everything else. So we're stuck with their bloody ideas, but you know, they, they, they belong in the dustbin. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get them there. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, but I would say, Steve, I'd say if I was going to articulate a response for you that would... Um, in that spirit of the paradox of the fence or the, you know, the Chesterton's fence, I would say it's not so much the doctrine of the neoclassical material. It's, it's some of the systemic structure that we've set up in place, like a um, like monetary, some of the monetary policy or the banking system or, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve, these kinds of things that are structurally in place are, you know, are worth keeping intact and then uh, oh, look at this. The, 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 the structure is inevitable. I mean, that was one intriguing thing about Dirk talking about the structure of the European Central Bank. We're the only central bank that doesn't have private banks as as uh, as its customers, which I think is crazy. Um, but everywhere else in the world, you, if you're going to have a central bank, you do have to have private banks having accounts there because that's how they settle their internal transfers. So I mentioned what you're saying with the with the, the European system, Dirk, it's going to be Spanish banks have accounts at the Spanish Central Bank, and they, that's where they do their settlement effects through there. Um, but the, the CCB itself, I mean, I'm quite intrigued as to how they actually manage to do the bond buying they do, uh, because they wouldn't have the uh, private banks uh, as their direct customers. So they would, in, in fact, the, the CCB buying bonds off private banks, which is what they did with quantitative easing, would actually be like the Federal Reserve buying bonds off non-bank financial institutions. Is that correct? Well, I mean, the actual the, structure. The bond buying programs are run by by the national central banks. So the ECB is is basically determining the size of the bond purchase program and the conditions. But the actual bond buying is done. Ah, uh, so it's a, it's a policeman on it's behalf a poli of the ECB. It's a policeman. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they're they're like the policeman. And the down below the banks are the bookies, and they're told well, the central banks are told how much they're allowed to issue. So basically, this, the European Central Bank is is central, but it's not a bank. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a very small bank, <laughs> just a couple of customers. <laughs> like other have you spoken there? there? Have you spoken at Have you spoken at the ECB? Uh, no, I was not invited to ECB yet. <laughs> but I've well, yeah, spoken there twice. But invited by the trade union, not by the not by the management. Yeah, yeah I, so I a um, of things like this happening. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's uh, it's both it's basically a network of people, but it's it's uh, it's okay. Um, we have our own network, and we're trying to take over uh, these kind of uh, institutions, trying to to teach our stuff. And I mean, people really do wake up, and they see that our economic solutions work much better than than the other ones' solutions. Um, so I think that, that that's a very nice kind of thing to, to see. So there's, there's a lot of momentum now, I guess, for, for our kind of economics. 
it helped. I mean, I'm, I'm actually noticing it by the extent to which I'm getting attacked for my views on Twitter. There's a guy called George Seglin. You may have seen him having a go at me in the last couple of days. And uh, as much as the, you know, it's irritating to see that sort of stuff, it's nice to find that I'm irritating those idiots because it, it, it's much worse to be ignored. They're trying to, yeah. uh, they're trying to rubbish us now. And that's the old, what's the old saying by, um, I don't know if it's Mahatma Gandhi, is that at first they, first they laugh at you, then they ridicule you, then you win or something of that nature. They ignore but you, that's, but that's, then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So we're getting to the point. But the thing is, it, there's such... Uh, there's such a strong desire to hang on to that vision because, as you know, with the neoclassical framework, if you remove any single element, if the whole bloody thing collapses. So if you remove the idea that money doesn't matter, then the whole barter and mentality they have and optimization and so on, that goes out the window. And rather than the, you, know, you, mean the, you have the classic supply and demand, you know, you only get to the middle of the cross if there's no government and government will disturb you. Therefore, that's really bad. Uh, but when you when you bring the um, re reality in and see that the government actually creates money and that you have an expanding system in that sense, then you have to have uh, the government is an essential part of it. And and therefore, the whole logic falls apart. So, yeah, it's it's a good sign. And that's I think like I've got to take my hat off to MMT people in general because it's the only time a non-orthodox idea has actually cut through into the public discourse. And the extent to which we're being attacked now is a sign of the success. Not that it's yeah. not that it's bad to be attacked. It's actually good to be attacked. No, absolutely. I, I completely agree. I mean, that's that's opening the doors. Uh, and I think it's it's opening the doors and there's, there's more people now walking through those doors um, talking about, for example, inflation. Uh, Isabella Weber, for example, is now very prominent in the debate. Um, yeah. and, I mean, we, we have a, a lot of very good explanations. And I think that that people are interested now more into this kind of economic problems because those problems don't go away. OK, so the, the 90s were yeah. kind of quiet and then everything was disrupted by this big global financial crisis. And then everything was quiet again. But now everything is completely in shambles. And I mean, it's so obvious that public services don't work, that they're underfunded. And uh, and when it comes when it comes to talking about reality, uh, then heterodox economics is is like a hundred times better than new classic economics, um, and and that's why I think yeah. the time has come to, that many people now are convinced that we have to change the way we we look at the world, um, and yeah, I mean you have also contributed, of course, Steve. Uh, so it's, one, it's not only MMT, but it was a whole bunch of of forces which kind of created an opening. Um, but again, uh, I think many, many heterodox economists will slip through in the next couple of years. That's hope so. Yeah, I mean, the trouble is just, it's how, I mean, you talk about writing a textbook for MMT and the big dilemma is you won't get your textbook used at a university system. So tell me about how you've tried to get around that particular dilemma. Well, <clears throat> I will do an online class um, and I hope that uh, the online class will convince people that this is the way to go forward. So um, I will create this class with <clears throat> with material that that is based on the book. So you will get slides, and you will get exercises, and you will get answers to those exercises which are in the book, and you get multiple choice tests. And I'm going to create lots of extra material. So what is not in the book is going to be created in extra online videos. So, for example, we are all getting older, and the students, for example, they don't remember. No kidding. The global financial crisis okay so they don't remember the euro crisis so i will have lots of historical stuff being debated in youtube videos and and then of course part of the stuff is going to be free but then every once in a while i'm, I'm going to put stuff behind the paywall and say look you have to to go and, and, and go into my classroom and and buy the course and then you can get and you can get you can learn more about money um so i think it's it's good to to learn to learn from a, a course about money. So it's great to have online videos and it's great to have written papers, but I think a whole lecture series, uh, I think that's that's what is needed so that people see the whole monetary system as a whole and not only bits and pieces. Because I think it's, it's gotta say, explanation is all yeah. we need. I mean, it's not so complicated. You can, you can teach that kind of stuff inside, let's say 12 lectures, it is possible. Yeah. 
And one thing I must admit, I'm very bad at is writing textbook exercises and stuff like that. So give us, can you give us some examples of some of the textbook exercises you put into into the book? <laughs> yeah, well, I have I've lots of them. So I have 12 chapters. So I'm not talking about the German version because that has already been published. And I have about, I don't know, six to eight pub exercises. And I have also six to eight questions that, uh, that I give at the very end. So at the end of each chapter. Each chapter, yeah. So it's it's really a textbook. Yeah. Um, so for example, I sometimes I ask questions of understanding. So so I ask, why does the government create money in the first place if it's not there to facilitate commercial transactions? And then they have to go back and say, oh well, yeah, it's the government who creates money because they need to provision themselves with resources. Um, and I have no, I have no numerical questions, so I don't have the multiplier, and they have to make some kind of calculation. So, given the little c is equal to zero point four, and little s is equal to oh, zero point yeah, yeah, one, yeah. that kind of stuff is is not in there. So, I have questions of logic. So, I discuss also sectoral balances. So, I ask questions like, what happens if the government sector is in a deficit, and the private sector is in a surplus? What what must be the case when it comes to the current account? And then the students will have to say, well. Those things are possible. It depends on the size. So these kind of questions which help you kind of play around with the material that I give you. Um, and I, I hope that this is kind of convincing uh, that students like it and that they they know how to apply this kind of lens. So MMT for me is a lens. So I have left left hand side. I have my assets here. I have my liabilities. And that allows you to have a look at the economy. And the nose, you've got the equity. Okay. Yeah. Mine's equity. like this at the moment. Okay. Well, <laughs> we, we should also <laughs> talk about the great. equity of the central banks because that would be interesting in itself. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, that's the idea of the book and the, the online lectures um, that hopefully the students like those questions and they like to work with the textbook and they're happy with it. And then mouth propaganda hopefully should do the trick. So it's, a part, so it's actually a package. So you've, got, you've written a textbook. And yeah. you're producing your own online lecture series. Yeah. And there's a okay. What could you better provide us with the website for that? Because there is there a website up and running for you? No, not yet. So, yeah, the, the, so ah. I have my own my own website. So if you just Google my name, you'll find my website also in English. Um, and I will publish yeah. information about the course when it's okay. published. I'm not sure where I go. Maybe Udemy, but there's different kind of of uh, publishers now for online classes. And I'll, I'm just going to pick something which is convenient for me. Okay, so they went, okay, there's, I'm actually using a system called School for the courses oh. that I'm putting on right now. Long yeah. story behind that. It wasn't my idea. It came out of a, a marketing company approaching me, and we've had a long time getting the, the marketing message right. But they're, they're good, good people, so I'm sticking with them. But you've also got uh, Quora, and what are some of the other some of the other online systems where you can give uh, – what, what's it called? There's one I, I see promoted – uh, Brilliant, I think it's called. Oh, brilliant. brilliant has a, a system. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to choose something like like that. When do you intend starting? Oh, that depends on on how the children evolve here, <laughs> and and how uh, the, the children. Yeah, yeah, we have two two small children, um, and and my wife is also she's um, she's probably changing her career a little bit. So um, we have a lot of of issues which are open right now. Um, so ideally, I would oh, like okay. to start next year working on this course um, and publishing the textbook. But I mean, you know how it is. I mean, publishing a textbook. It, I mean, the last, the last twenty pages take forever, <laughs> and now I have to update the book. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, shouldn't take too long. I mean, latest twenty twenty six textbook and course should be online. That's my guess right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Well, well, I'll see you in Leeds. I'm looking forward to catching up with you there. Yeah. So cool. just let everybody know there's. There's a Modern Monetary Theory conference in Leeds taking place. When is it, Dirk? Is it July? I keep on losing track of the dates. Yeah, mid-July. I don't remember what exactly. Mid-July, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so myself, Stephanie Kelton, Dirk, Warren Mosler, quite a few of the others are going to be there. And uh, and I think it's uh, it would obviously be you know, online as well as uh, local, but I encourage everybody to come along to that. And uh, it may be the, the biggest non-orthodox economics conference in Europe this year. Yeah, that would be great. Mm, cool. Okay. okay. St Steve, I want to just, right. you know, we're going to keep that thread yeah. just for a little bit more about that Leeds conference. What do you expect? Are you doing anything formal in the conference? Uh, presenting? Oh, yeah. No, well, what I've, 
uh, there's there's a there's a backstory to this which I won't go into, uh, but I'm going to uh, the, a huge but neoclassicals critique criticise uh, MMT all the time, saying you haven't subjected yourself to mathematical analysis, um, and when you look at what they do, they subject us to mathematical analysis, making neoclassical assumptions such as at the end of time, you know, the infinity in the future, government debt must go back to zero what they call the transversality condition, which they use normally use to rule out the idea of private Ponzi schemes and stuff like that, which, of course, happen in the real world, but not in neoclassical models. Uh, but in the government case, they presume that ultimately the government must get back to zero. Okay? So they, they then, and you impose that on MMT and say, I'm sorry, that's a bit like saying you're going to bring gravity into the Ptolemaic model, but still presume the Earth is the centre of the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So nonsense. So what I'm saying is what you guys haven't subjected yourself to is accounting analysis. And fundamentally, the basis, as Dirk implied a moment ago, of MMT is proper accounting. When you do the accounting, the government does not borrow. It sells bonds. Uh, and, and and the government debt is always you're going to have you're going to have zero government debt, which is the end objective of the way the neoclassicals think about money. Uh, the, the bringing the monetary system in. If you have zero government debt, you're going to have zero government money. Okay? So their idea is we're going to put you into a, a mathematical test assuming that at the end of time, money will not exist. And so I'm sorry, money always exists and you guys have to get used to it, but they won't do it. So yeah. this is my, my revenge on the neoclassicals. Great. We've got, great. A, we've got a link here. With, yeah. Oh, what's the uh, link, Steve? On the YouTube. Yeah. Well, it's there on the YouTube. I'm trying to find it. Uh, where's the chamber? GIMS, there you go. So yeah. it's the Gower Institute Initiative for Modern Monetary Studies and the conference is July 15 to 17 at the University of Leeds, which is a good place in general, but there's a very good progressive university uh, course there. Uh, Gonzalo, it's Gonzalo Fon, uh, Fonseca. I keep getting caught between Fonseca and, uh, and the other, uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe Fontana, who's one of the uh, main personalities there good people and leads in general so it should be a very enjoyable experience okay uh dirk i'm going to give you the final and the women order. running it as well as pointed out here the wonderful women of gims yeah. very very correct yeah. yeah yeah dirk i'm going to give you the last word i'd like you to um i'm not going to put you on the spot and have you scramble i'm very simply going to ask you what do you expect or what do you hope to see come out of the uh the leads conference and then and then we'll all sign off uh, for this week just to let everybody know in advance we're not going to be here next week so it's the week after but uh yeah dirk what do you hope to get out of the of the conference well um i think the united kingdom they they have had this situation where i think labor has said that they will not be able to spend an additional i think it was something like 20 billion pounds a year on on green investment because they said, and that's a quote, they said that they already maxed out the government's credit card. Okay, so the United mm. Kingdom is in a, in a very bad situation. So it's taxpayer money miss being being propagated by labor. Um, and we try with our conference to make make sure that people have an alternative framing here from us, uh, that they can, can learn that there's a different kind of view of money and that the United Kingdom has a government which doesn't want to spend any money. They will, by the way, they will do some tax cuts, I think, this year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as Steve already said, I mean, whenever there's, uh, there's money that has to be found for the military, well, yeah, no problem. If you have to find money for tax cuts, financing tax cuts, which is really ridiculous, uh, but anyway, uh, that's also there. But whenever it is mm. about money that has to go to the NHS, for example, um, so healthcare provision by the government, then there's no money. Or social security, there's no money. Social services, there's no money. So I think we, we kind of hope to raise awareness that, that the, the British public sees that there is an alternative way of, of looking at that. And uh, there's also a lot of intellectual curiosity in, in British circles. So if, if people are seeing this and thinking like, OK, this makes sense. So logically, it seems to be consistent. So maybe let's let's invite Warren Mosler for an interview or let's let's have somebody else send a paper and, and then maybe we can enter those debates. I mean, in Germany, this has already happened. So we have this stupid German debt break, which may mean that the household, the budget of the government goes, is always smaller now, or just increasing just a little bit. 
uh, but they now talk about uh, decreasing government spending for 2025, and Germany is roughly in a recession right now. Um, so, I mean, by now it's so obvious that something's wrong with the theory um, that sometimes just a little push maybe is needed, and then we can we can open up these public debates that we all want to see. Um, so, I'm kind of optimistic that the elites conference can can help us achieve that. Um, plus, the ladies from GIMS who are really always doing amazing work. Um, so, yeah. Thumbs nice note them. to leave it on, uh, Dirk. And uh, in, in in that note, he ended it with a, a thumbs up there, Dirk. And Steve gets all give a thumbs up. Thanks, guys. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank and you. we're out of here. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.